It, it really is. It really is great to be with you here. Uh, I've been here before. You had the bleachers out before, but obviously you've changed that for the time being. But I do, as as you've heard, I do want to talk to you about about Peter. I want to talk to you about what I consider possibly the thing that is the biggest struggle that we all have to deal with. The biggest struggle. If I were to ask you what would that be, you may say, well, it's I'm worried about COVID or I'm worried about Ukraine or I'm worried about life or I'm worried about health. Or, but I want to talk to you about shame because I think shame is one of the biggest challenges in our life. So if you have a Bible, would you please be kind enough to turn to Luke chapter 22. And as you heard, I'm going to be reading about Peter, which we've heard about already this morning. And it's a familiar bit of scripture. You know it well, I'm sure. But I want to open a few things up about this, and I hope it'll serve you. So as you're going there, let me pray. Father, I pray this morning that by your grace and through the illumination of your Holy Spirit, we may see something of ourselves from this text. But more wonderfully and more gloriously, we may see something of your Son and Savior, Jesus Christ, who changes our lives and brings joy and grace and hope and peace where there is none. So help us this morning. Help me, Lord, in my weakness to be able to serve these good folk. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to read from verse... Where shall I start? I could do an awful lot here, but I don't want to. Just verse 54. It says, Then they seized him, that's Jesus, and led him away, bringing him into the high priest's house. And Peter was following at a distance. And when they had kindled a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat down together, Peter sat down among them. Then a servant girl, seeing him as he sat in the light and looking closely at him, said, this man also was with him. But he denied it, saying, woman, I do not know him. And a little later, someone else saw him and said, you also are one of them. But Peter said, man, I am not. And after an interval of about an hour, still another insisted, saying, certainly this man also was with him, for he too is a Galilean. But Peter said, man, I do not know what you are talking about. And immediately, while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed, and the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And Peter remembered the saying of the Lord, how he had said to him, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times. And he went out and wept bitterly. There are so many scriptures that relate into where someone suddenly feels shame but there's probably none more powerful than here. That last line, and he went out and wept bitterly. Why would that be? Well, because after three and a half years with Jesus himself, after being the main spokesperson, the closest one, to the one who's leading the disciples, the one who's always there with Jesus, after three and a half years, he blows it massively. Everything changes. It says about the girl, it says, seeing him in the light and looking closely at him. Nobody wants to be seen in the light and be looked at closely. But that wasn't the biggest issue for Peter. It was when Jesus looked at him. Because at that moment, he realized that he has done everything that he shouldn't have done. In Mark's account, which is from Peter... It says he, at that point where he was questioned, he called down curses upon himself and he swore oaths to them. He pulled out everything he could to deny Christ. Curses that say, if I'm lying, let this happen to me. Making oaths before God that he's never known him. And the result is he goes out and weeps bitterly. Why? Because of his shame. Now let me help define shame for you. There's a difference between guilt and shame. Guilt is feeling bad for what we've done wrong, essentially. Shame is feeling bad for who I am. 
And there's a significant difference because shame is far more powerful and far more dominating. As, as a Christian, my guilt in some ways can be assuaged. I know what I believe. My sins are forgiven. When I turn to Christ, he died on the cross of my sins. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed my transgressions from me. He has cast them into the depths of the sea. My sin is gone. Wonderful. So we gather together and we sing or we read our Bibles and we talk and we go, thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sin. It's gone. However, this is where shame comes in. Even though Christ died for my sins, I'm still the kind of person that did that, said that, thought that, didn't do that, didn't say that, didn't think that. That's still the essence of who I think I am. Oh, I know I'm forgiven, but what a wretched man I am that would even go there. A wretched woman I am. It's like, imagine it like this. It's, it's like thinking of casting your sins into the sea. Imagine your sin is like a rock and that you know you sinned. You know what's going on, and, and you turn to the Lord and you know he died, and he takes the rock, and the rock is cast into the, cast into the sea as far as east as to the west. But it's like the, the rock has been sitting in a sheet, and it's taken out of the sheet and thrown away. The sin is gone. But the stain of the sin, the stain of where it was, the sheet is dirty. So you go to your internal laundry basket, you lift the lid, you take the dirty sheet, you push it in, you close the lid, and you thank Jesus that he's died for your sins. But deep within, there's a reminder of, but that's who I am, and that's what I've done. We put it in this shame container and try to keep the lid tight on it, and it bulges, folks. And every time we sin, we, we do it again. We open that up and we put it in, and we're grateful that our sins are forgiven, but this shame container gets bigger and bigger. It's a critical, continual reminder of who I am. And there are memories in there that identify me and cause me to think this is the kind of person I am. Now, there's two things about shame we need to know when we get onto this. Firstly, it's not always linked to your own sin or weakness or mistakes. You can feel shame for things done to you. And after 37 plus years in pastoral ministry, I know for myself and I know for others that things that have been done to them can create shame. Things said to you, things placed upon you by another. We see that in the Psalms, and David explains this. My mother said, some dreadful things to me. I remember growing up, I won't say them to you because you will sit and weep. But I think she wasn't a Christian. Um, but you've seen things. You remember when Cliff Richard went through all that trauma when he was being accused of, uh, of, of sexual immorality with folk. And he went through all of that and then they found in the end there was just no basis to it. He said, I came to the end of myself. The shame was unbearable. Although he was innocent, we see it all the time in the news. So shame can come even when it's not linked into you, it could be placed upon you, and it comes through accusation. And it can be true, it could be false, but it creates shame. Accu accusation almost takes that shame container within us and starts to rip the top off. So you may be accused for something you didn't do, but you also know yourself. And you know if they open the thing to, to look inside, there's enough stuff in there that I did do. I may be innocent of this, but guilty I stand of so much else. And this is who I am. I didn't do this, say this, think this, but there are other stains that terrify me should I be exposed. It's the horror of, of nakedness. We see it in the garden, Adam and Eve. They were naked when they recognized their sin and ashamed. This is who I am. 
It's a reality. Who, who accuses us? Well, Scripture says Satan accuses us. He is the accuser of the brethren. You are not who you think you are. You are really like this. Others accuse us. Paul lived with this. He's continually, particularly in 2 Corinthians, trying to explain to them because of the shame they're trying to place on him. We condemn ourselves. We accuse ourselves. When our hearts condemn us, the Scripture says, our hearts do condemn us. An accusation can turn shame into crippling anxiety. Let me give you some examples. And there's 10,000, 100,000 others of what will they think of me? What do I think of me? What does God think of me? Missing the penalty in a cup competition. It's never going to happen to me because I hate football. I'm too old and I don't play it. But we've seen guys for years living with the shame of that missed penalty. Missing the party because I have nothing to wear. How I look. Standing on the scales at Weight Watchers. Or not going to Weight Watchers because you're standing on the scales. Not getting your A-level results in person because you know what they're going to be. And you can't take the shame of seeing your friends. People come around your house and there's apologies for the mess or the meal or the inconvenience. Always apologizing. It's based on shame. The parent whose child has just rejected everything they've ever believed and has gone off on their own way. The wife whose husband has left her for another. What was wrong with me? The fear of a work assessment, the unmarried person who didn't want to be unmarried, but it's just never happened, and then there's a shame. What's wrong with me? The old man who needs to be taken to the toilet by another. The pregnant, unmarried mother. The mum who feels she's just doing everything wrong. The Christian who is on antidepressants because it's the only way they can keep going. I'm this. The man in his 50s with mental illness. The girl who continually goes back to cutting herself or stopping eating and becoming anorexic. It all comes from this depth of within of shame. This is who I am. This is who I see myself. And this is who... I'm sure others see me. Whether we're aware of it or not, shame lives in us. And we devise coping mechanisms to try and subdue it. So, what do we do? Fight or flight, essentially. When you think of flight, you run or hide away. What happened when Adam and Eve became aware of their sin and a shame? They ran and hid and covered themselves up. You might quit job, you might leave a partner, you might abandon a family, you might stop going to school or college or leave a church, pull away from friends, become a recluse, stay quiet or say too much, move away, and at worst, shame can cause someone to take their life. And I know people who have done so. I have cut people down from a rope. I have run to the hospital to see them in the morgue. What's the basis of it? Shame. Even though they said they were Christians and may well have been, they just couldn't live with the shame of who they were anymore. In Psalm 55, David prays, Oh, for the wings of a dove, that I might fly away. The whole psalm is about shame. And the shame that's been placed upon him. And that is, we sing that, I don't know if you remember the old hymn, Oh, for the wings, for the wings. As if this is this fun thing, Oh, wouldn't it be nice to fly? He is desperate to run away. Oh, for the wings of a dove, that I might fly away and go into the wilderness. Just away from here. I don't know if you've ever felt that. There's times in my life I have felt that. I just want away from here. 
I was talking to my wife, Jenny, and saying, you know, for some people, shame is worse than death. Death feels like the better option. Almost like those people at, in the Twin Towers. You remember the images. And I was reading an article about why people would jump from the Twin Tower, knowing that they would die. And it was about suicide, and they said, you know what, it's just like that. Nobody wanted to die. Nobody wanted to jump. But the pain of the flames was too much. People who get to this point get there because of shame mainly. So you run or hide away, or you fight, you transfer the blame. What happened in Genesis 3, when they were ashamed, they ran away and hid. God met with them, asked them what was going on. What happened? Adam goes, she did it. In fact, it's your fault because the woman that you gave me, she did it. So he questions Eve and she says, the serpent did it. One of the things we try to do to cover our shame is to transfer the blame. We, we, we don't want our shame container open, so we try to open somebody else's and distract. So we use distraction. We use, it might be sport, it might be alcohol, it might be the cutting of yourself. We overcompensate. I'm so much better, let me show you and let me tell you. Problem is, none of these work. Peter goes away bitterly ashamed. I denied him. I turned against everything I was. How the mighty have fallen. Oh, Peter, this is who I really am. That's all the bad news. Let's get to the good news. What is the answer to this? What is the answer for you and for me and for Peter? What is the answer that will take us away from that sense of this is who I am into the glorious liberty of the sons of God. I got five things. Here we go. Firstly, the look of Jesus. Look at this in Luke 22. And I'm going to quote from a book in the end, and I took this from this book, this thought, but I remember it hit me profoundly. He says, and the Lord, verse 61, turned and looked at Peter. The question is, what was that look? Disappointment? Well, the Lord knew. He, in fact, he told him what was going to happen. Was it anger? Oh, Peter, how could you? Was it shock? Well, of course not. You know, he, as the crow crows the, the third time, he looks from where he is over at Peter, and Peter catches his eye. It wasn't shock. It's not disappointment. It's not anger. What is that look? You know that look. It's the look of love. He sees a man in his desperate weakness, a man who said, I will never leave you. I will be there with you. I'll go the whole way. You can count on me, and blows it more than anybody else. And he looks at him, and there's nothing but love and affection in his heart. He knew when he called him, this would happen. I, I was saved in 1980. August, August 1980. So I was 20 years old, which makes me 62 soon. And, and God, when he called and saved me, knew the beginning from the end, knew it beforehand. He knew all that I would be, all that I would think, all that I would say, all that I would do, and all that I wouldn't. And yet, in knowing that, he called me and said, I will never fail you nor forsake you. I will never leave you. And that's the look. How do I think God sees me? responds to me. Here's the premise. Always, always love. Always affection. Always deep love. A love so deep that it sent his son to die 
for me. That's how he sees me. So we see the look of Jesus. Secondly, the response of Jesus. Let's go to John 21. We read bits of this to you. Again, you know this. This is after the resurrection and Jesus comes to Peter. Oh, well, no, it's not that. He's in the boat, isn't he? They're out fishing again. Oh, surprise. And they're out and fishing in chapter 21. And, and I can't read all of it. We don't have time. But Jesus says, have you hadn't got any fish? And they said, no. And he says, cast the net, net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And here they have the exact same situation that we heard about earlier where the first time Jesus calls them, now, right at the end, he tells them to cast the net in and he's almost taking them back to that place where he started. But he's taking one person in particular back. Says that... uh, Jesus jumped out of the boat. Says he put his, in fact, he put his clothes on to jump out of the boat, which doesn't make sense to me. But he puts his clothes, jumps out of the boat, and swims for Jesus. Why do you think Peter's doing that? I'll tell you why Peter's doing that. Because this is the first opportunity that Peter could have to be alone with Jesus after that look, after that betrayal after that denial. This is his chance. Am I still accepted? What would you expect? Like, hey guys, good to see you, Peter. You can get lost. I know what you did. You know what you did. The other boys don't know what you did because they weren't there, but we know. We know. You called curses upon yourself. Well, be cursed. You called oaths about God. That is hell. You denied me to everybody. But none of that we find in verse 15. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus says to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord. You know I love you and you feed my lambs. And, and he goes right the way through. He asked him three times for three denials. And in those three times at the end, he says, you're going to make it right through to the end, basically. When you're old, they will stretch out your hands. And by this, it was how he was going to die. But you will make it, Peter. The shame that Peter felt through the look of Jesus and the response of Jesus is wonderful. That first day when he says to them, follow me, he's doing the same to him. Do you know, God comes to us like that and goes... I can put this aside and start again. The mercies of God, Lamentation says, are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. And Peter, and we find nowhere does Jesus even speak of Peter's betrayal. He doesn't say, as so often we can do so. Okay, take me through it. What did you do? Why did you do it? What made you think that was the right thing to do? What did you feel the consequences? That's where we go. He just says, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? You'll make it. Not a mention. He does not go for his shame. He puts it aside through his response. The payment of Jesus Thirdly, again, says in Hebrews 12, verse 2, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. You know, we think of Jesus as in these pictures of of on the cross with a loincloth around him. There was no loincloth. The Romans did not crucify anybody clothed. They stripped them bare in order to create more shame more shame as they killed them. He despised the shame. That doesn't mean he hated it. It means he took it upon himself. He took the shame of Peter, which is why he didn't need to bring it up to him. On the cross, as he does ours as well, 
We talk about our sins being gone. But he didn't just carry our sins. He took our shame. There is no loincloth at the cross. The last Adam was as naked as the first Adam who blew it all and sinned. And here's the last Adam, naked, who says it is finished. It is done. It is over. And carries our shame. Fourthly, the promises of Jesus. Oh, I, we don't have time. The, the greatest, one of the most wonderful promises into this is in 1 John 1 verse 9. You know it, I'm sure. It's, if we confess our sins, John goes on to say, none of us can say we have no sin. If we say we have no sin, we lie and we make him out to be a liar. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins. There goes the rock. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. That's the sheet. Where's the shame container? I don't just forgive your sin. I keep no sheet with the stain. There is no record of wrong. I cleanse you from the unrighteousness. It is not just, I didn't just die so that you would say, yes, but this is the kind of person I am. No, what I do is I die for your sin, but on the cross, this is not the kind of person you are. This is not the kind of person you can be. I take away your shame as well. This is throughout the scriptures. 1 John 3 verse 20, when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. 1 Peter 2 6, whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Hebrews 8 verse 12, he remembers our sins no more. Lord, you remember you cast that sin into the sea? No. Why? I choose not to remember. Hebrews 12 verse 11, he is not ashamed to call us brothers. Shame can be crippling. It can drive people to the end of their lives, but it can drive every moment. Want to know what's happening in Ukraine? It's linked into Putin's shame. Because on the 22nd of February, he invaded Ukraine because eight years to the day, the puppet that was there in Ukraine got on a plane and legged it out of Ukraine because of the Orange Revolution. And that caused Putin to have incredible shame that he'd lost something. And that's why, to the day, he goes back in. It's related into shame. It can destroy people. It can destroy relationships. It can destroy souls. And Jesus died for our shame. Finally, the anticipation of Jesus. Talks about no shame at his coming. In 1, in 1 John 2, 28, we shall not be ashamed at his coming. Let me read it. Because this is, this is just, this is fabulous. Let's get all the way out to John. 1 John 2, verse 28. And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears, this is right at the end, when we go to be with him, when he appears, we may have confidence and not shrink from him in shame at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness, which means trusts him, has been born of him. What do you anticipate on that day? Do you anticipate, people used to talk about, you know, on that day, there's going to be a video played of your whole life and everybody's not only going to see what you did and what you didn't do, but what you thought, what you said. Everything will be uncovered. Oh my gracious, 
How does that make you feel? It terrifies me. The deepest thoughts of my heart laid bare for everyone to see. I would shrink in shame at his coming. Back away. He says when we appear, when he appears, we don't want to have to shrink in shame. We can have confidence. How? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 5. Verse 1. 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Let me go there. And then... I can't read it all. Let's just read verse 5. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes. So he's talking about the end. Who will bring to light, oh no, the things now hidden in darkness, oh no, this is about opening the shame container, and will disclose the purposes of the heart, oh no, then each one will receive his commendation from God. I don't know what you anticipate, but because of Christ and his imputed righteousness to you and me, on that day when our sins have been forgiven and cast away and remembered no more and we stand before him and he opens the shame container, there are no stains. In fact, there's nothing there. What God will do to us on that day, the judgment that we passed from because it was placed upon Christ is just commend us for those things that brought him joy and glory. That's all we get. But what about this, Lord? What about that one thing? What about that way of life? What about that covered by the blood of Jesus Christ? But I know, but this is who I am. No. You can be sure that everyone who trusts him stands in his righteousness. He sees us at our best not our worst. On that day, he's going to be singing our praise and revealing the best about us. And the rest is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. Cast into the sea, without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. It's such wonderful good news. Let me finish by reading a bit. If you haven't read this book, may I? I really want to commend it to you. It's by Dane Ortland. It's called Gentle and Lowly. And it's deliciously wonderful and filled with grace, particularly the last few chapters. It's a bit of a long reading, but that's all we're going to do, and then we'll finish. He says this, Perhaps looking at the evidence of your life, you do not know what to conclude, except that this mercy of God in Christ has passed you up. Maybe you have been deeply mistreated, misunderstood, betrayed by the one person you should have been able to trust, abandoned, taken advantage of. Perhaps you carry a pain that will never heal till you are dead. If my life is any evidence of the mercy of God in Christ, you might think, I'm not impressed. To you, I say, the evidence of Christ's mercy towards you is not your life. Oh, hear this. The evidence of his mercy towards you is his. Mistreated, misunderstood, betrayed, abandoned, eternally in your place. If God sent his own son to walk through the valley of condemnation, rejection, and hell, you can trust him as you walk through your own valleys on your way to heaven. Perhaps you have difficulty receiving the rich mercy of God in Christ, not because of what others have done to you, but because of what you've done to torpedo your life, maybe through one big stupid decision or maybe through 10,000 little ones. You have squandered his mercy and you know it. To you, I say, do you not know what Jesus does with those who squander his mercy? He pours out 
more mercy. God is rich in mercy. That's the whole point. Whether we have been sinned against or have sinned ourselves into misery, the Bible says God is not tight-fisted with mercy, but open-handed, not frugal, but lavish, not poor, but rich. That God is rich in mercy means that your regions of deepest shame and regret are not hotels through which divine mercy passes, but homes in which divine mercy abides. What's the worst thing about you? That's where there's the most mercy. It means the things about you that make you cringe most make him hug hardest. It means his mercy is not calculating and cautious like ours. It is unrestrained, flood-like, sweeping, magnanimous. It means our haunting shame is not a problem for him but the very thing he loves to work with. It means our sins do not cause his love to take a hit. Our sins cause his love to surge forward all the more. And it means that on that day, when we stand before him, quietly, unhurriedly, we will weep with relief, shocked at how impoverished a view of his mercy rich heart we had this is good news if you are a Christian today all this is yours in Christ Jesus and if you're not it can be turn to him and say forgive my sin take away my shame let me be seen in you amen let me pray, and if the musicians want to come back, we are going to sing that song. Cast into the sea, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Father, as we, as we see ourselves in Peter, maybe not in such a dramatic way, and yet there are times as we look to our own hearts, we could weep and run away with bitterness as who we are. I thank you for your look to Peter as your look to us. I thank you that your death for Peter is your death for us. I thank you that your promises for Peter are your promises to us. I thank you that on that day, we will not stand ashamed before your throne because you hung ashamed on the cross but we will stand only being commended for all the things that your grace did in our lives. I thank you, Lord. May every person here today be able to be free from shame and all that that means to live in joy, peace, and righteousness for their good and your glory. Amen. 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 Amen.